Good morning and a warm welcome everyone to this online policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center to discuss about the liberal challengers that only last month contended elections in Hungary, Serbia, France and Slovenia with various degrees of success. In Hungary and Serbia, strongmen like Viktor Orban and Aleksandr Vucic respectively retained their power positions with easy victories. And especially in Hungary, Fidesz actually won by a landslide. In France and Slovenia, more moderate centrist forces managed to defeat populist dragons like Marie Le Pen uh, and um, Yanis Jansa, but the re-election of Emmanuel Macron, for example, was less glorious than expected, given that the far right polled at levels unprecedented in the post-1945 history of France. What do these national electoral results tell us about the state and future of democracy in Europe, in particular given the ongoing war in Ukraine and future spillover crisis? Do they prop or do they back the liberal trend? And what would amount to an appropriate response by the democratic camp? To take on this and, and, and other questions, of course, our distinguished panelists today uh, include Susie Dennison, Director of the European Power Program at the European Council on Foreign Relations, Nicola Burazer, Program Director at the Center for Contemporary Politics and Executive Director of the European Western Balkans, Beata Baco, a Reconstitution Fellow at Central European University Democracy Institute and Senior Researcher in the Law Faculty of Charles University Prague, and Marko Lovic, Associate Professor at University of Ljubljana. Thank you very much to each of you for accepting our invitation today. We will start with what I hope will be a lively exchange on the subject among the panelists, and then I will invite comments and questions from all of you in the audience. To intervene live, uh, please click on the raise hand button on your screens and wait for me to give you the floor when the time comes. Otherwise, um, I encourage all of our participants to write their questions in the comments box, not the chat box, the comments box at any time during the discussion and to keep it short. I will do my best to wave in our discussion as many interventions from the public as possible as we go. And with that, let's get started. A first general question for all our speakers. What are some key messages that emerge from this recent presidential and parliamentary elections in Europe with regards to the main cleavages that are shaping our democracy at present. Please feel free to focus on the country or the countries that you know best. Beata Bako, would you like to go first? Thank you and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so maybe I think uh, mostly it was not surprising that Fidesz won again. The only thing it was surprising that uh, they won again a two-thirds majority, and I think it's uh, largely due to the uh, war in Ukraine. Um, and, uh, well, I think we shouldn't pretend to be shocked about uh, populism. We should just accept that uh, democracy is a populist game, and uh, the reason why the opposition couldn't win was that they, they were not populistic enough. I, I mean this in the good sense of the word. So they just calibrated their messages to the middle-class intellectuals, and they didn't even try to speak with the voters of Fidesz and speak with the lower class workers, uh, people in the countryside. And just with, with the middle class intellectuals in big cities, you cannot win an election, not just in Hungary, I think nowhere in the world. Um, I think it's somewhat sad that the opposition uh, didn't manage to, to learn this lesson <laughs> through more than 12 years, but uh, that's what happened. And, um, also the war in Ukraine, which was uh, a key uh, subject of the campaign in the, in the last weeks, um, they also missed an opportunity to emphasize or missed a good campaigning opportunity because Orban and Putin and Orban uh, is quite friendly towards Russia. And although they tried to emphasize that, but they posed this uh, as a moral question as, voters should uh, choose between the West and the East, democracy and, and uh, Putin style autocracy. 
and nobody cared about these moral questions. When there is a war in the neighboring country, everyone is concerning about safety. And Orban was just uh, sending the same message, peace, stability, uh, we don't uh, let, to, let us to somehow be involved in this war. And um, the opposition of prime minister candidate committed, I think, a huge failure when in an interview he publicly stated that practically uh, we would do anything the NATO wants in this war. And it would, uh, then it was easy to be interpret that the opposition would uh, allow Hungary to enter into this war. And of course, people were, were scared about that. Fidesz even didn't have to lie to, uh, to depict uh, the situation like this. Uh, so I think the reason why they uh, managed to get a two-thirds majority again was that people were scared about the war and that, they, that the message of stability and peace uh, was very important, apart from Orban. Um, and um, yeah, so it was like being the undecided voters in the last minute who, who helped Fidesz to, to win such a big. So it was like nominally, it was a record number of votes they received. Uh, they received uh, 3 million votes, which is more than ever. For now, maybe that's enough. And then we will then elaborate other arguments later. Thank you, Beta. So the ge geopolitics helped, but also uh, the opposition played their hand um, wrongly in a sense. Um, Nicola, maybe I come to you next. Um, how does the situation look from another country that has successfully bred and sustained authoritarian tendencies? Well, uh, good morning. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would say that the uh, victory of Alexander Vucic in the first round wasn't very surprising. There was hardly anyone who was uh, surprised by uh, the result being the the way it is. Uh, actually, we can we could we could argue that uh, his party, the Serbian Progressive Party, won less than was expected on uh, parliamentary and uh, Belgrade uh, elections. So the the victory of the of the SNS and Vucic wasn't as convincing as as uh, the polls have shown. Actually, before the before the um, elections. Uh, the thing is that the regime in Serbia is uh, pretty stable, and nobody really expected any any drastic changes uh, uh, in the in the short term. Uh, the best thing that the opposition maybe has hoped for was to uh, have a possibility to form a government in Belgrade uh, to to go back to the parliament because currently there is no opposition in the parliament at all. So to go back to the parliament that also raises chances in the future to challenge um, the regime. Now, the nature of the Serbian regime, I would say, is in a way quite similar to the one by Fidesz in, in, in Hungary uh, when it comes to the methods of, uh, of ruling and uh, these uh, comparisons are often made, especially when it comes to media freedom and how government is uh, basically employing media capture to, to prevent challenges uh, uh, coming to them. But uh, there are still some very big differences. Uh, the SNS uh, is not a party that I would label uh, far right party and uh, perhaps not even a populist party in that classic sense that it is used in uh, in Western Europe or let's say uh, the European Union. The SNS is according to its program, it is a center right party, um, but in essence is a catch all party and not only in the sense that it targets the middle voter, but also it, start, it tries to target everyone because it has so strong media dominance basically across the board. So it is able to simultaneously send messages of devotion to European integration and progress orientation on the one side. There are people in the government who are responsible for this kind of messages. At the same time, you have those who are, let's say more to the right, who are more nationalist, who are more turned to, turn to Russia. And there are media then who echo all these messages to the target audiences. So you have like pro-government media, which are quite clearly pro-Russian, which tend to appease the pro-Russian voters to show them how the government is actually uh, cooperating with Russia as, uh, as good as possible. On the other hand, you have some other media, which are, let's say, more, more Western, so they are targeting some, some other audiences. So it's really a, a catch-all party, uh, which is, I think, a specific case. Uh, some uh, statistics or some estimates is that the SNS uh, has around 700,000 uh, members in Serbia, which is like 10%, uh, more than 10% of the total Serbian population, which certainly shows you that uh, basically strength of the SNS uh, 
I mean, does not come from any particular ideology, but comes from their firm grip on, on, on power now for the last 10 years, their hold over uh, public enterprises, their possibility to employ people, both in public sector, also in private sector. So people are kind of attracted or they are in some cases forced to become members of the party and actually do the work for the party if they want to re retain their jobs, not only them, but their families, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a, it is a regime which is, almost devoid of any particular ideology which you, you can cling to and uh, and attack it of course you can you can examine you know uh, the, all the messages and then say okay uh, sns is some kind of uh, uh, right wing uh, nationalist but also uh, cautiously pro european party but it doesn't really matter in, in in the practical sense you know even even the voters you know they're not really i would say address ideology when they go to, to vote for or against uh, the government because on the opposition you also have various uh, ideologies uh, present so uh, the main division basically is whether you are for the government or against the government where people are uh, on the one hand blaming the government for being authoritarian and on the other hand of course everyone had their own reasons some people think it's too european some people think it's uh, too nationalist so basically it, it's a very very uh, 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 bizarre case uh, the war in Ukraine did not really, I would say, affect the elections uh, that much. Uh, and uh, um, the, if it did, uh, you can argue it affected it both ways. On the one hand, you could say it maybe helped those parties, both in the government and in the opposition, who were much more strongly against imposing sanctions on Russia during the, during the campaign. Uh, because, well, uh, let's say the, the an average voter was against the sanctions, or especially the the voter of the of the nationalist uh, parties. So uh, you could say it maybe helped uh, some far right opposition uh, uh, and some parts of the government. Here, meaning the Socialist Party of Serbia, which is uh, which has stronger connections with 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 Russia. Uh, but on the other hand, it also shifted. I, I find interesting uh, uh, to hear uh, about, about uh, Hungary because here uh, in Serbia, in the middle of the campaign, so um, uh, the campaign of the SNS was based originally on the messages, um, together we can do anything. And uh, uh, like uh, our actions uh, say for themselves, where they were promoting economic development, construction around uh, you know infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. But after the war broke out, they changed the message in mid-campaign, and the new slogan was "Peace, Stability, Vucic," and so they kind of co completely tried to force this narrative where uh, there is a global conflict going on, and Serbia is a small country under pressure from both sides. And what we need to do, we need to look at their own interests. We need to ensure stability and peace. And this is why I have to vote for the government because it will protect stability and peace. Then the government was literally showing pictures of stockpiled food as evidence that it's doing its job in, you know, like uh, preventing catastrophe. And of course, it raised panic. People started buying those things themselves after they saw the pictures, but it worked. It frightened the people. And, uh, and, and you could argue that this helped the government shift the focus from topics such as corruption, the environment, et cetera, to the topic of stability and peace. And of course, always the parties in power are those who have advantage, you know, when it comes to crisis and responding to crisis. So you could say it benefited the party. Now, how much it benefited the party and how much the other, other aspect has, has actually damaged it, it's now impossible to, to assess, but maybe we can do it in the next couple of months after the, everything settles. Yeah, and of course, it might have helped domestically, but um, with regards to Europe, it has put um, uh, Vucic in a, in, a, in a bit of a difficult uh, situation, hasn't it? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it is quite clear that there is a lot of pressure now in Serbia to align itself with uh, EU's foreign policy by imposing sanctions on Russia and also uh, by voting in other international uh, fora. And uh, I mean, this is a commitment Serbia has had, you know, since they began the uh, session negotiations, but uh, EU member states were never that focused on this specific issue. They were more focused on delivering uh, when it comes to Kosovo, rule of law, et cetera, not about, you know, foreign policy, but now it's become a hot topic. And of course, this pressure is, will, will be impossible to bear for the government if it, uh, if it wants to still remain 
on uh, on the European path, uh, even theoretically. So it will have to change the approach. It already has it to some to some degree. We could have seen some small but still important symbolical steps in when it comes to uh, you know being harsher on Russia, the voting, for example, uh, in the UN uh, about uh, expelling or suspending Russia from the Human Rights Council. Also condemning the Russian uh, aggression in, in the UN uh, only a couple of days after the after the invasion. So you could have seen these these uh, these uh, steps made even before the elections but now after the elections it is i would say a matter of certainty that the government will will have to uh let's say uh, uh turn more towards uh the west or let's say align more uh with the european union it will not be easy due to popularity of russia in in serbia and of course the promises the government has made itself before the elections but um, uh, there is some kind of public consensus here uh, that uh, it will have to happen because Vucic, no matter how much Russia is important for him due to his voters being largely sympathetic towards Russia, losing the European perspective would be much more damaging. And of course, this doesn't mean that it would end with Serbia aligning 100%, but there will certainly have to be some kind of alignment to, to show commitment, to show uh, some kind of uh, change in direction, which uh, the uh, European partners expect from Serbia. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Nicola. Uh, Marco, I come to you maybe. Um, Jensa is a friend of Orban, but he couldn't replicate his friend's success. What, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, you're right. Uh, maybe he didn't have enough time. It was a government mandate lasted only for two years or something like that. And it was also a minority government. So it, it uh, he had to count on votes of people, members of other parties uh, who were not, you know, fully committed to his government, but were more uh, concerned about their themselves ending their mandate because it, it was it was a high chance that they will not get another mandate uh, after uh, the elections. So um, after the elections in Slovenia, there was this article published in New York, New York Times, which said, forget about France, Slovenian elections. This is the big story, a big victory for uh, liberal, uh, liberal democracy. Uh, and um, the reason was, uh, the reason for that was that Slovenia has been sort of uh, backsliding uh, uh, in terms of uh, democracy, liberal institutions in the last two years, or perhaps perhaps even more, uh, that Jansha has been an important ally uh, of Orban and his government has been you know, moving rightwards. It was a nationalist uh, government, populist in, in some aspects, far right in some aspects, but also pragmatic. Uh, on, on many other uh, issues. And now after Jansha has lost uh, elections, uh, Orban is sort of isolated in Europe also because of the war of, uh, in, in Ukraine and uh, some differences in, in positions of uh, Central and East European countries on the war of Ukraine. Orban has pretty much uh, found himself uh, isolated. And then another thing which was pointed out in this article uh, was a very high turnout. So over 70% of people showed up uh, at the elections day. It's a lot. It's more, uh, we, we haven't had that high turnout since 2000, so for over 20 years. Uh, and probably the reason for that uh, is that uh, uh, there, there was a strong competition, so it was not, according to the polls, both sides, either Jansha or center-left opposition could win the elections, so this is something that motivated uh, many voters, and also Jansha's behavior uh during during the pandemic and uh, the attempts you know to get a grip of different public institutions independent institutions interfere with media civil society and so on has mobilized lots of voters that would normally not go to the elections in part this were young people women uh, as well young women who went to vote against Jansha, but also uh, people who would normally vote for right-wing populist uh, uh, parties or who would, you know, sort of are people who would 
just not go to the elections because they are disappointed with the elites in general and so on. So many of those also went uh, to vote against Yansha uh, because of many of the of the restrictions that were imposed uh, during the pandemic. So it's not it perhaps it's a, it's it's a too it would be too simple to say that it's a victory for liberal uh, democracy in Slovenia. Uh, because uh, Janša well, did move towards uh, right side of the political spectrum, but at the same time he was not able to uh, attract uh, all the you know right wing voters, extremist voters, and so on. Many of whom were revolted by the fact that they had to sacrifice certain things uh, during the during the pandemic. Uh, so. Perhaps uh, one thing about the Ukraine and your skepticism and nationalism in Europe uh, in, in general. Uh, so Yansha's government has been moving towards more towards the center in the last year. So even before the war in Ukraine, especially in the second part of the Slovenian EU Council presidency at the end of the, of the last year, uh, Yansha has adopted more moderate tones. After you know the the victory of Biden in United States, and after uh, after support for many populist and Eurosceptic parties and partners of Yansha went down uh, around Europe, Yansha did try to to change his his tactics. He was hoping for EU institutions to sort of. Uh, applaud to, to the end of Slovenian EU presidency. He was hoping to get some uh, external legitimacy that he, he, he needed basically to convince more centric voters. And uh, in the beginning of this year, when the war broke up in Ukraine, he attempted to, to take advantage of that to show himself as a pro-European, courageous, moderate uh, politician. And he was one of the first uh, um, prime ministers to go to, to, to visit Kiev, and uh, he did get lots of media, positive uh, media coverage, uh, international media coverage for that. But it seems that it was not it, it was not enough. And at the same time, many more extremist right wing and left wing voters were sort of revolted because of, of what he did. Uh, it, unfortunately, many people in Slovenia are you know still quite pro pro Russian. Uh, so here again, he lost some of the votes, but he didn't, you know, win enough uh, to be able to to win uh, the elections uh, at the end of the day. And just another thing that might be more relevant, you know, from from a more general perspective, uh, we can see that um, uh, the, the the game changes when populists come to power. Uh, so you know they cannot they, they cannot just you know use their radical uh, rhetoric. They cannot just criticize the elites because then you know it's them who become the elites. So the game changes and uh, many you know voters uh, become disenchanted about their the, the role they are actually playing. So this is one thing that explains this decline of of populists and Eurosceptics uh, and. Uh, uh, the other thing is that uh, in the past, especially in the past 10 years, when we had a number of crises, EU-related crises, centrist voters were demotivated. So we saw a decline of turnout of centrist voters uh, at the elections, and this created more space for more radical uh, political uh, ideologies. But now, in the, in perhaps in the last two or three years, we have seen the return uh, of the centrist voters, because centrist voters realize that things that they took for granted, such as you know, independence of institutions, functional democracy, freedom of media, and things like that, that those and if if you want EU membership, that those things should not be taken for granted. That this those things could be could be lost in the near future. Uh, and this again, you know, mobilized centrist voters and and uh, impacted on the elections. And as I said in the beginning, luckily Yansha did not have enough time. It was a minority government, a two-year mandate to change things in the direction in which they went in in Hungary or uh, Serbia. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Marco. Um, and I mean, mm, that's probably true, but. 
is it really something that we can generalize? Because I mean, I'm thinking of um, just Hungary and, and, and Serbia where um, these leaders and, and, and part, their parties have been in power for quite a long time. And, and the simple fact of um, uh, being in office hasn't really um, uh, affected their, their power grip, so to say. Um, so can we really say that, that this is an explanation for, for why in the end they are defeated? It doesn't explain the situation in all the countries, but as I've said, uh, Jansha did not have enough time to make his party uh, a part of the you know, ruling regime, to take control of, of mm -hmm. different institutions and media and right. so on. So he was not, he was not strong enough. In, in many Western mm -hmm. countries where uh, populist parties which come to power are not able to you know, take grip of all the institutions, we are seeing a similar trend. Also in Poland, if you want, Polish you know, mm -hmm. populist government is mm -hmm. rather in a weak position. It doesn't control uh, the opposition it doesn't control all the media and so on. Mm -hmm. Also in Italy, in France, you, you see this return of centrist voters. But of course, in Hungary and and Serbia, situation is different. Partly because of of the of the of the of the um, electoral system they have, for example, in, in Hungary. Partly because populists have been in power for so long that they have become part of of the institutions. Their power mm -hmm. is embedded in state institutions. It's not, it's not just you know the power of parties. It's 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 the power of state institutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, Susie, do you read a trend behind these elections, or or are they in fact rather context specific? Um, thanks, and, and thanks to everybody um, who's spoken so far for really fascinating presentations. Um, <clears throat> I think my answer would be both. Um, I think there are some trends here, but I do also think that um, the, the outcome is very um, specific to the domestic context each time. Um, in terms of um, the general trend, I, I, I think plays into all of these pictures. Um, the one point I want to draw attention to is that um, populists seem to be um, better than the mainstream at sort of dealing with this sense, um, which we can see among the Euro European electorates quite broadly at the moment, um, that the, the deal doesn't work anymore. That, um, uh, you know, sort of Susie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. If you go out- Susie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Pay your taxes. Um, if you we're pay we're the hearing you with a lot of interruptions. I wonder if it's maybe better to turn off the camera just to give it a try. Uh, okay. I'm just sure. worried that we yeah. cannot hear you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Does this sound better now? I hope so. I hope okay. so. Please continue. I'll try again. Um, so yeah, I was just I was just saying that a sort of general trend that I see is this better? Not really. You can't hear me. Okay, uh, we can, but it still it still cuts a little bit. But go on, go on. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, the general trend that I wanted to draw attention to um, is around um, a sort of a sense among the electorate that um, the system, the political system, doesn't deliver anymore. Um, that life doesn't get sort of progressively better um, if you participate uh, in elections, if you participate. Um, uh, in terms of paying your taxes and so on, um, that um, the sort of the offer um, uh, is getting more difficult. This opinion polling, actually, since the European election, Parliament elections in 2019. Um, but we um, we asked the question again um, in January this year about whether people felt that the national system is broken or it works well. And what we could see there is that around 58% of Europeans overall. Um, were concerned that, that it wasn't delivering. Of the countries we're talking about this morning, and interestingly, that was 69% um, in France, um, but much lower at 52% in Hungary. And I was listening to the conversation, wondering whether there is a role there about the fact that, you know, you have the, the sort of um, populist parties, which are naturally um, uh, sort of opposition uh, parties, um, uh, in power um, in, in Hungarian um, 
uh, context and, and, and elsewhere and, and whether that sort of plays into the picture about the, the national system is, is growing. Um, is this, this the sort of um, the sense that bring either? Um, and I think that this is where we've seen a, a sort of a COVID effect um, because, you know, we asked the question about whether um, on big challenges like climate change and um, dealing with um, global health, the international system works. And there you can see even greater discontent. You, we saw 71% think the system's broken on climate cooperation, and 60% on COVID um, in this poll that we did across 12 um, EU member states earlier this year. So I think the point I want to make about um, populists is that they, 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 they sort of seem to be becoming more effective at identifying these issues, um, the, the concerns about cost of living, the concerns about um, threats uh, such as uh, pandemics, um, uh, climate cooperation and so on, and, um, and, and tapping into that. And as you alluded to in your introduction, I think um, in the French context, this sense is huge. So um, over 30% um, of people voted. If you add in Mélenchon voters, who are also extremely anti-system, uh, sort of want an overhaul of the capitalist system, um, want to kind of start from scratch again in terms of the way we do politics, you get to over 50% of the electorate who are voting for these anti-system parties. So I think, um, you know, how um, different political parties engage with these uh, these big sort of threats that voters feel um, is, is absolutely crucial. Um, but that said, I think sort of the what, what is um, very specific to the French context is the way in which the different players have worked with this picture. So I, I think we saw an extremely clever strategy from Marine Le Pen uh, in the presidential ele um, election campaigns to, to carry out a very loud campaigning in the streets. Her focus was on the socioeconomic dimension, which was new in these elections. It was not about really identity politics and immigration. Um, it was much more um, uh, about the cost of living and how you deal with that. She was, in a sense, working on everything that Macron, Macron wasn't. He was extremely absent, um, uh, partly because, um, and I think this is where the Russia invasion of Ukraine did play into the French elections, that his focus was on the international scene. Um, he refused to engage in, um, uh, in, in political debate um, ahead of the second round. And, and so um, I think he looked more distant. Uh, and Marine Le Pen looked more sort of hands-on. And in some ways, she looked more mainstream um, than Jean-Luc Mélenchon uh, in terms of the sort of type of uh, politics that she was doing. And, you know, I, just to sort of make the comparison to the Hungarian context, I think that this sort of um, uh, correct identity of um, how to play um, the international picture was also there in, in, the, in Orban's approach uh, ahead of the elections. You know, he toned down his pro-Russian message um, after the invasion to begin with. He cooperated with the EU to begin with. And it was only sort of once um, the elections were passed that he's, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, the real message starts to come out um, more strongly. Um, just kind of um, two more points and then I'll stop because I can see from your faces that my connection is still not great. Um, so uh, <laughs> the, um, I think the, I would also identify bad strategy from the mainstream um, uh, in, in the French elections as being a key factor. You know, in, in the last presidential elections, the Parti Socialiste, uh, which has been one of the main bastions of politics for, for decades, uh, disappeared. And then in this election, Les Républicains, the centre-right party, um, uh, also disappeared. Uh, and they, they completely failed um, in both cases uh, to have a sort of a clear message on um, or to understand what it was that was really driving um, voters around these um, socioeconomic and climate uh, questions. Um, and they, um, they, they, off they offered nothing sort of new. Um, but I think, you know, this was also actually a big failure on Macron's part um, not just in the election campaign, but in the five years of his mandate. But at the beginning, he promised a new kind of politics um, uh, to do things differently, to work grassroots up. And in the end, what he offered was um, just the same kind of politics. He appears very sort of connected with business, very elitist. And I think that his approach to, to refuse to engage in the political de debate ahead of the um, elections only um, undermined this. 
So I think the key challenge now in the French context is to demonstrate um, the humility um, uh, from uh, the, the re-elected president, but he recognizes that although he won this election, um, that he's, his campaign was not the strongest on the issues that voters actually care about. A lot depends on the legislative elections which are coming up next month in France, um, in terms of how effective he can be in his next mandate. I think if um, uh, Mélenchon wins the majority that he's expecting to, um, as a kind of, um, and, and you create what's called co cohabitation in France, uh, where you have the opposition party with the majority um, in the legislative assembly, um, then, uh, then this could be quite positive for French democracy in a sense that actually the system can deliver. My concern is that because of the personalities of both Macron and Mélenchon, there will be no space for compromise. And therefore, if we do end up with that outcome, the system will be blocked. Uh, and we will have five years um, where voters feel um, again that the system isn't delivering. And I think that opens the door wide open for five years time uh, from Marine Le Pen or her successor. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Susie. Um, I think you write that uh, populists often raise the right questions, but then again, they also just as often give the wrong answers. So um, that's something to, um, to discuss a little bit, whether it's only a question about um, speaking about the issues that the electorates care about or also having the solutions um, for, 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 for what um, uh, worries people. And then the other thing that I wanted to, um, uh, to ask is, is actually a question, since you spoke about the, the French case, a question that comes from our audience. Um, Andris Peterson is asking whether in France we can actually speak of a collapse of politics because who is not populist there among all of the actors that you've mentioned? Um, would you have a comment about that? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, but I would, um, I would almost say, um, I, I think we certainly can talk about um, the collapse of uh, uh, the collapse of politics in in the sense that. Um, there was huge disillusionment uh, in, in this election um, about the level of debate, the lack of um, real political debate and, um, uh, and, and, a, and a real sense among voters, I think, that um, there was very little point uh, in, um, in, in, in putting their, um, their choice in the envelope in the ballot box because ultimately the way the system was set up, there was only one possible outcome. And I think that that was incredibly um, damaging this election, although in the end, um, the turnout wasn't as bad as many predicted it was going to be um, uh, in either the first or the second round, but still historically low. Um, but um, but all that's what I would disagree with in the question. I, I almost think that Macron isn't populist enough. Um, I think that his failing is um, is not to recognize um, precisely uh, that that voters feel in France that um, uh, that they don't they want to be taken more seriously and they don't want to be steered by um, a disconnected elite who doesn't understand um, the realities of life and um, uh, you know the, the the sort of the the force which created the gilet jaune um, at the beginning of Macron's mandate um, still feels very much uh, uh, disgruntled about the issues that they went out to protest on but also now that community, I think, feels extremely disgruntled by the fact that um, there was a huge effort to hear their opinions, to create um, these kind of uh, public um, bodies to, to discuss exactly how we should gra grapple with the climate question, um, uh, how we should um, deal with um, the cost of living and so on. And then all of their feedback is perceived to have been ignored. So I think that that, um, in a way, that is also part of um, Macron's failing in, in terms of his promise of doing things differently, um, that he, he, he did the consultation, but then he didn't actually listen. Okay, thank you so much to all of you. Um, now, maybe one question to follow up um, is, is to ask, um, 
why do you think that we are seeing these kind of actors in some countries and not in others? And especially if I think of Central Eastern Europe and the Balkans, why do strong men seem to be concentrated there um, if, if we compare it with, with the rest of Europe? What is it that uh, creates a fertile ground for, for, for them in, in, in those um, contexts, national contexts? Bata, would you would you want to share your opinion about this? Yeah, I, I um, anyway, I wanted to react to Marco's idea about the um, that the undecided voters activated against Jansha, and I think it's related somehow because so I think the problem is in Hungary there is there is no mass of uh, of um, centrist voters, so there is not enough centrist voters, even if they could be somehow activated and. Exactly the, the similar effect was expected by the team of Peter Mikrizai, who was the oppositional candidate, that he might be able to activate these centrist voters because he himself is a conservative and uh, he, he wasn't a, he is now a mayor, but but formerly he, he worked out of uh, outside of politics. But I think this didn't work for more reasons. One reason is that he had to bargain with the opposition parties all the time. And it was very difficult. So he was, uh, his hands were tied uh, by the opposition parties, and people somehow realized that uh, he couldn't uh, himself bring the change because even if he is not a politician in the sense of the word, he his policies would be uh, defined by the opposition parties, and these opposition parties are unacceptable also for many centrist voters. That's that's why they couldn't be. Um, Effectively uh, activated at this election, um, and I think. But but know, Berta, why do you think there are no centrist voters in in there um, are, but in but Hungary? Few. But uh, why? Why? Uh, the the society is is deeply divided, and also mm -hmm. the public discourse, and it it was always been like that since the democratic transition. But uh, since Fidesz is in power, it's just getting worse and worse, and mm -hmm. it's like there is two uh, two Hungary, and they are just like it, the dialogue of the beef, they didn't even speak, speak with each other. So there is no dialogue and there is like two words. And I think mm -hmm. it's somehow very sad. And uh, in this um, in this environment, it's really difficult to be centrist. Hmm. Um, and there is, I will actually also uh, use this opportunity to ask you a question from the public. Um, Andris Peterson is also asking whether Orban is now more isolated because of no right-wing alliance with Polish, French, and Italians. Uh, yeah, I think he certainly expected uh, to be able to establish a new right-wing uh, European party family or uh, group in the European Parliament after they were forced to leave the European People's Party. and. Uh, yeah, um, that uh, didn't work. So probably he is more as isolated in this sense. And also because now over the war in Ukraine, uh, the good relationship with Poland seems also be uh, damaged. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Beata. Um, Marco, how do you explain uh, this um, the success of this kind of actors in Central Eastern Europe? And I will couple this with another question that comes from our public um, and asking why did the con conglomerate of different political parties or visions worked in Serbia and not in Slovenia? Is this only explained by the fact that Jansa did not manage to control the state and the media? Okay, so <clears throat> many questions. First, yes. about Central and Eastern Europe and the specifics of this region. And this perhaps also applies to some of the, you know, candidate and potential candidate countries in Western mm -hmm. Balkans. So we need to understand that for, for, for a long time, like for 10 or 15 years, for first half of the transition, European Union was essential, not just European Union, but also other your Atlantic organizations was essential for the legitimacy of the elites in our transition countries. So basically elites to be legitimate had to follow those organizations, their recommendations, implement different policies and so on and so forward. But then after the EU enlargement happened, after our accession in 2004, there was big disenchantment because things did not change as much as people were hoping for. And this sort of demotivated, this was the first 
this was the start of the demotivation of the centrist voters. So many would not go to the elections. Many believed that we were now sort of second grade citizens of the EU. We, we didn't have you know, German salaries and so on and so forward. So this was the start uh, of the decline of the support for the EU. But then the, the more, more important point were, were, uh, the, was the global financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis, and which was then followed by the migration crisis, because in those crises, EU turned out to be dysfunctional. And, and many of the Central and East European countries were substantially affected by those, those crises, which is often, you know, not, not uh, uh, a part of the story that has not been told. You know, uh, Slovenia and Hungary were dramatically impacted by the Eurozone crisis, uh, also by the migration crisis. In 2015, Slovenia, uh, Hungary took in largest number of, of uh, migrants per capita uh and we, which you know uh, of course many went onwards but it, it explains this political reaction in hungary and explains why Ur orban was able to build uh, his politics uh, on this because he was not doing that well before the uh mi migration uh, crisis struck orban and in slovenia we had a very centrist government liberal centrist government at the time but the uh, government could not just you know resist the pressure like almost 1 million migrants entered Slovenia, which is a country of 2 million people, and pressure from right-wing opposition was immense, and people thought that uh, sort of we were, you know, left, left on our own by the EU, which was dysfunctional, could not agree on how this crisis uh, will be handled. So this big uh, demotivation of the centrist voters and disappointment with the centrist elites, which were so much pro-European in the past, uh, created political space for nationalists, for radicals. Uh, Jansha and Orban, they, they were quite, you know, liberal, moderate politicians uh, during the transition. But with this change in the context, they have they have moved sort of more rightwards. Now, the the positive thing is that the context is it's changing again for better. EU did perform during the pandemic. There's this idea of the European Green Deal, lots of money being available for sustainable transition, also Ukraine, and then disappointment with some of the populists in power. So in Slovenia, we, we can be optimistic. In many other West European countries, we can be optimistic as well. But probably in Hungary, in, in, in Serbia, we cannot be optimistic. And, and, and why is that? Uh, because uh, populists have been on power for some time. Now, they no longer can use this rhetoric of you know we corrupted elites we have to replace corrupted elites because they are the elites so what they are doing at the moment is that they are pointing their fingers fingers at brussels and they are saying well, well we have to, we have this brussels elites which are constraining our you know our politics which are acting against our national interests and there is this plot of of neo marxist from Brussels and from our countries and former communists or whatever or whoever, uh, who, who are the actual you know, deep state elites which we have to fight in order to free uh, our countries. So this is what they are doing. And this in, in many ways has been successful and it has enabled them to, to stay in power uh, in, 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 many, in many countries. Um, Marco, I want to go to, to Nicola and uh, for, for the same question, but before I will bring in um, the, the other question from our audience that has been addressed to, to you. Is it not Golob and socialists who are in fact the populists? How pro-Russians are they? And is this, is this why they won? Um, one of our um, participants is asking. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting question. As I said uh, already, it was a mix of, of voters who voted for, for Golob. Um, but most of them, I think, were you know, quite centrist voters. They were not happy with the fact that government is interfering with independent institutions, with media, with civil society. Uh, they were afraid that Slovenia will go down the road that we have seen in, in Hungary. And this was, I think, the strongest, uh, this was the core of the opposition uh, towards uh, towards uh, Jansha. But then, of course, there were also others. 
you had you know people who who believe that corona doesn't exist if you want uh, you had you know radicals both on the left on the on the right who went against Yansha and it's part of it's part of uh, politics but as, as for Ukraine if you look at the polls Slovenia is a bit you know if you want pro-Russian compared to average uh, EU uh, public opinion. Uh, however, it doesn't mean that, you know, we su Slovenians support Putin regime and things like that. It just means that part of the left side of the political spectrum is more pacifist. They would not want us to get involved in the war of Ukraine, and part of the right-wing uh, political spectrum is also sort of more, you know, nationalist, anti-United States-oriented, and things like that. And this is what impacts uh, this view of the war of Ukraine at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marco. Um, if anyone um, in the audience wants to ask a, a question or make a comment uh, to our panelists live, then please raise your hand. In the meantime, I come to, um, uh, to Nicola. Do, Nicola, do you agree that maybe European, the, Euro, the European integration process uh, actually holds the key to understanding the success of Vucic? Uh, well, to, to some degree, yes. Uh, and to, to answer your uh, original question, uh, why are countries in this region, let's say, more vulnerable to this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, regimes and uh, this kind of politics? Well, I would say it's because uh, of uh, undeveloped democratic institutions. For example, Serbia began its transition only in, in 2000, which is late even for uh, uh, Central and Eastern European standards. So there was not enough time to actually build uh, democratic institutions which would be strong enough to, to basically uh, present a barrier to this kind of regimes uh, emerging. And I mean that in two senses. So first of all, there were, not, there were no strong institutions that would have the legitimacy, would have the capacity to be independent actors regardless of who is in power. So this is something we haven't managed to build before Vucic uh, uh, came, to, came to power. And another big problem is the political culture. Uh, research uh, in recent years has shown that in Serbia, there is a large number of people who believe that uh, in some cases, at least, some kind of autocracy is more efficient than democracy. And also I remember some research from maybe like five, six years ago, which was for me quite interesting, uh, which showed that in Serbia, there was the highest number of those who said that it doesn't matter whether a country is democratic or authoritarian. So that's something that shows that it's not about authoritarian, let's say support, but just the lack of, uh, lack of uh, basically relevance of this issue for a majority of the population, which means that if a government delivers in some way, then, the government would get the support. We had Tito here for, well, 45, uh, actually 35 years, and people are still fond of the memory of Tito, who, who was able to be like a strong man, who, who, who could enable people to live, you know, good lives and to travel abroad and, you know, and, uh, and basically have some kind of uh, social security, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to say the footage is a, new, is a new Tito, but there are some comparisons to be made. For example, the number of people who are members of the party. So it's even higher now than it was during the communist times. And also Vucic is trying to portray himself as a, as a strong man who himself is basically uh, running the country where everybody else is basically under him and where he's even correcting the mistakes of his of his uh, party party colleagues and uh, government officials. So this cult of personality has been, has been built and it had a fertile ground basically in this country, at least with memories of, uh, of Tito and of course some, some other people maybe still cherish the memory of Milosevic, but um, this is not the, the fundamental, fundamental thing. So in these circumstances, of course, it's much easier to see uh, a liberal or authoritarian regime emerging than in the consolidated uh, democracies. And where does the EU integration uh, fit in this picture? Well, uh, definitely, uh, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as Marco said, uh, EU accession was, uh, from the very beginning of the Serbian transition, uh, a fundamentally important goal for the, uh, for the government. And uh, all governments uh, had this as their main strategic goal. And it was a matter of their legitimacy to show that they're doing everything they can to make uh, the country part of the, of the, of the European Union. 
Uh, and therefore, democratization went hand in hand with, uh, with EU accession and with progress in EU accession, which was, a let's say, a positive positive loop, which, which did bring results. Uh, Serbia definitely changed a lot since 2000 until 2012. Uh, obviously, these were not irreversible changes, but still, uh, there was a lot of progress, which some of, some of it actually is irreversible. I would, I would even say. But the problem there is that uh, this means that uh, the European Union has a lot of impact in, in the country and uh, can be quite influential when it comes to uh, basically democracy uh, uh, being uh, stronger or, or weaker. And why I'm saying this, because the, the, the governments that uh, were in power before uh, Vucic, uh, they had a lot of problems to deal with uh, for the sake of EU accession, uh, primarily the issue of cooperation with the Hague Tribunal. Then, of course, they had uh, the independence of Kosovo in 2008, which uh, which is a big which was a big blow to the pro-European parties. But they still delivered practically everything they were required by the European Union, um, including arresting all those war criminals, which was very unpopular at the time, and they had massive protests against against them, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this whole array of problems Serbia faced in the 2000s, which other countries maybe did not face in the EU accession, brought a lot of political crisis, even brought the end mm. to that of the Prime Minister Djindjic. So it was a very turbulent time where Serbia managed to actually make the, all of these steps forward. And then uh, from 2012, basically, we have had a uh, new government uh, coming, practically a repeat of the 90s uh, with the parties who are in power, but this time with the blessing of the European Union, which, well, some member states at least thought that it would be a good idea to have these parties in power because they can deliver on Kosovo. So again, sure. it was also, of course, connected to your accession because you have to uh, normalize relations with Kosovo if you want to become a new member state. So then again, even the, the ascension of Vucic to power was connected with the EU accession and demands from EU yeah. accession. And at least for the first uh, couple of years, there was quite open support for the Vucic government coming from Brussels and coming from the EU member states because he was seen as somebody who delivers when it comes to Kosovo, when it comes to stability in the region, et cetera, et cetera. But this happening has happened like literally- Despite his democratic credentials. Parallel with quite clear democratic deterioration visible uh, since 2014 at the latest, and you can probably say even 2012, and it was largely ignored because the EU accession was fundamentally important, and then, you know, Kosovo as a part of it was also fundamentally uh, important. Yeah. So the but, but actually, was the negative, uh, but, but actually, right on that point, and building also on what Marco has said, do you think that it is precisely this tension between um, the political imperative to imitate, that is to um, do what Brussels say, to adopt all the conditions and fulfill all the requirements for membership on the one hand, and then the desire to, um, to, to, to preserve and to express your own identity and sovereignty. So the tension between this, this, this two aspects that is actually um, allowing Vucic to, um, to do what he's doing. And, and same for Orban, really. I mean, the, the government is trying to portray all the demands or let's say messages coming from Brussels, all the criticism regarding rule of law, democracy, now foreign policy doesn't really matter as 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 pressure as unjustified pressure coming from from Brussels and the Serbian government is then trying to explain how they are actually doing their job well they're doing everything they should be doing regarding EU accession but there are these unjustified pressures uh, coming from 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 Brussels so basically that is kind of a mixed message so we want to be part of the EU we want to be there but when the same EU is telling us what we need to do to become part of the union something which actually we have agreed when starting the process then it is unjustified pressure and uh, and they are threatening our our, our interests and uh, our our sovereignty so it's a very dishonest approach to to to, to EU EU accession. And uh, there is definitely a whole set of messages in, in, in that regard. And uh, they were deliberately sent to population in the past uh, uh, a couple of years, which eventually led to, uh, to a decrease in support for EU accession. And even more importantly, led to uh, a complete loss of enthusiasm for EU accession. The process has not lasted for too long, basically for more than 20 years. 
so there is this fatigue you know when it comes yeah. to even discussing eu accession in, uh, in in serbia and the government manages to play quite well this desire of the population you know to 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 be part of the european union no matter what and on the other hand this resentment resentment basically felt by the population because of right. lack of progress and also because of some other issues connected with the process such as for example uh relation with kosovo Yes, exactly. A bit schizophrenic uh, sort of state of mind. Um, Beata, I know your hand is up, but I want to come actually to, to Susie. I see her hand is up too. So um, I'll, I'll allow you shortly to, uh, to, um, to make your comment. The, the one question that I, that I wanted to maybe ask specifically to you was, um, can we say really that um, the, ten, the, the, the tension or the um, the, the issue here is actually maybe um, the need to make a distinction between democracy as such and, and liberalism. Is this where distinctions and nuances start to, um, to come to, to the front? Um, thanks a lot. Um, I'm happy to um, ask, answer that question, but um, actually the reason I have my hand up is because I wanted to ask a question. I couldn't work out how to do it on the okay. Q&A box. Um, I wanted to ask um, uh, uh, Nicola about how the, um, the discussion over potential Ukraine membership was playing out in the Serbian context. Um, and I'm interested that in, um, in from others as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think on democracy and liberalism, um, uh, yes, um, I think I think that's right. Um, that we we can see, um, sort of broadly speaking, that um, the idea of um, the European project kind of centered around um, uh, the values of um, of democracy, human rights, and, and the rule of law um, remains quite sort of resilient in terms of um, Europeans thinking about what Europe's for. We did um, another public opinion survey um, in about this time last year. Sort of asking about what sort of global actor the EU should be and within that we we saw very clearly that the sort of the biggest idea was that it should be a force for democracy um, and human rights in the world um, but with that said um, I think that um, liberalism does indeed have sort of different connotations in different national settings and um, I think uh, that there is a sense in which um, and, and this is something that populists play very cleverly um, there is a sense in which um, sort of the, the, the idea of a kind of a global liberal um, conspiracy has kind of stolen the democratic project um, seems to be sort of tied in um, to my mind with, um, with, with, with this sense that um, this is precisely the kind of the elites that, that is the problem and, and therefore the kind of it, it's not necessarily a rejection of the values that that stands for, but the the the, the messengers um, who are sort of bringing that um, uh, bringing that forward that, that that liberalism is is the right response, and and I think you know if if you look in the French context as well, um, the, uh, the 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 sort of the return to yeah, the, the sovereignty debate is interesting because France is sort of the home in the European sense um, of the sovereignty idea. Um, and has pushed that sort of um, quite dramatically on a European level. But um, you can see in the French context that the most kind of negative views about the idea of sovereignty um, are in France when we do public opinion polling. So I think that um, that has that sort of project hasn't been sold as effectively in France as perhaps um, it has in other parts of Europe. And that, that sort of case hasn't been made as effectively. So I think there is a kind of um, a reconnection to the national level um, on some issues um, where, where it's, you know, it, it, there's, there's a kind of an idea that this is the sort of the right level, particularly around this whole cost of living, socio and economic direct, um, dimension, which is just so crucial at the moment. Um, and, and we'll get even sort of stronger, I think, with, with the growing energy crisis. Um, and, and the cost of that. I think, you know, that these is, remain issues that sort of um, voters think that should be dealt with at national level. Um, and they have some concerns about sort of the idea of um, globalism, international sort of comes with the liberal project um, uh, in, in, in order to respond on this. Yes, thank you, Susie. And, and France, uh, of course, is uh, also home to uh, 
um, to the to the concept of the left and, and right divide, and it's it's now actually the the one country that it's sort of dismantling this uh, uh, this left right divide and replacing it with with new politics. So that's quite an interesting um, change of um, turn of events. But linked to that, and also because you mentioned it in your um, intervention, initial intervention, um, would you say that the decline of traditional moderate left and right wing parties is actually creating this space for, for a new um, sort of, uh, of, of political animal to, uh, to emerge, whether we call them populists, whether they're radicals or anti-system or um, whatever um, other name they, they assume. Is, does that explain where we're seeing this uh, with, with increased frequency in different contexts? Yeah, um, I think it's an interesting question. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I would say that that actually France isn't the only place where the, the, the distinction between left and right is um, is becoming less relevant. I think this is something that we're seeing more broadly. And in a way, it's because um, the uh, the left and the right response on some of the kind of the big global challenges has merged to some extent. You know, if you look, if you take the issue of migration, um, which was traditionally something that um, the right um, of the sort of the political spectrum was most concerned about. Um, you can now see across the EU some of the most um, successful sort of centre left parties. You know, I'm thinking of Denmark here, but there are lots of other examples with sort of extremely um, uh, strong uh, uh, sort of border control, anti-immigration policies. Um, and you know, you take you know, you take other examples like the the question of um, of, of climate change, um, uh, where you know tr traditionally this was something um, which was tied up very much with the sort of the idea of the need for a strong international response, and I think still is in terms of the solutions that are on the table. Um, but it, it's in yeah in the French context certainly um, uh, it's been a, a theme which Mélenchon. Um, her, um, from the far left, La France Insoumise has taken on very strongly, um, uh, combined with an anti-internationalist agenda. So, you know, to, to me, um, one of the kind of the key division lines that I see in Europe now is indeed between this kind of, um, I don't know if I'd necessarily just call it populist, but sort of nationalist versus internationalist. That that seems to be um, uh, one, one of the... Um, the, the sort of the strongest narrative points that matters in terms of the way that um, politicians connect with voters is the extent to which um, they are selling solutions at a national level or, or in which they acknowledge the need um, for international cooperation. And I think, you know, the experience, and I'll end on this point, um, of, of COVID has been sort of quite important in this, that we've seen um, uh, how vulnerable we, we are, given how connected uh, we are, um, economically, um, uh, uh, you know, but, but also in, in, in terms of the way that we kind of can manage the movement of people, um, uh, which, which Im impacted so heavily on, uh, on the pandemic response. And, and, and so I think that, that that experience has sort of fed into um, uh, this questioning, really, of, um, of, of whether or not international cooperation is the only solution. Thank you so much, Susie. Beta, do you want to come in? Your hand was up at some point. Yeah, I just wanted to react uh, to Nicola's remark about uh, Serbian citizens' sympathy to authoritarianism uh, in, in context also of the EU accession, because I think it's also uh, a relevant question in Hungary and uh, the Hungary's rule of law debates with the EU. Uh, in Hungary, there, so there are a lot of controversies here. Uh, first, um, there is still a strong nostalgia present to the uh, socialist regime in Hungary still, unfortunately. Uh, that's the one thing. Uh, the other thing is that Fidesz uh, could uh, somehow uh, effectively send the message that the EU, namely Brussels, is similar to Moscow, the socialist Moscow, because now they are in good relations with Moscow quite up to recently when the war broke out. Um, because uh, they just depicted EU as an intervening uh, empire uh, to our sovereignty again. And I think somehow we should just see that um, in a country uh, which, which lived under dictatorship for decades and, uh, and earned its freedom quite recently, um, 
the, the notion of freedom is, is somehow different. So normally in, in Western liberal democracies, um, we keep the institutions of the rule of law and checks and balances to limit the majority rule, to limit our own national governments, which we voted democratically, but, but still we don't trust it. And that's why we keep the constitutional court to protect our individual rights and other uh, independent state institutions to, to create a balance to that. And, and somehow uh, in Hungary, it seems like um, it's not the, the most important thing, but the important thing is that we could freely uh, elect democratically a government and, they, uh, and others from outside shouldn't intervene, uh, whatever they do. So whenever the EU criticized the Fidesz undermining of the rule of law, they always uh, argued with their uh, democratic legitimation and accused the EU uh, to disrespect the Hungarian um, democratic will. Uh, so that's why I think it's, uh, it's just somehow different uh, in, in Central Europe. And I'm wondering whether in other Central European countries, when uh, where there are no, not such strong illiberal tendencies, but maybe this is also somehow present that, that the notions of freedom from our own state is maybe not that uh, important than the notion of freedom from outside intervention. Exactly. That's... Um... That's that's also why I was mentioning this 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 tension um, uh, linked to, to to the expression of national sovereignty. But um, now, of course, we're we're approaching the end of our discussion. So maybe for a very final round, what I would kindly ask all of you is in in a minute or so to um, uh, to tell me your. Um, um, prediction about what we can expect next. I mean, Marco has already hinted that he's quite positive about Slovenia. I don't know if he's positive also about other places in Europe or beyond. Um, and then um, one um, potential um, response or answer that um, uh, the democratic camp can have to um, to this kind of, um, of, of polit new political animals. Well, well, actually not so new. Huh? Um, so Maybe maybe we'll start from Marco since I mentioned you. So we'll just go around and, and this will be the, um, the final chance to, uh, to, to speak up in, in this event. Okay, thank you. So I'll try to answer and I'll use this question that you've raised previously on democracy versus liberalism. So many critics say that there's this centrist liberal bias with EU and European integration. And I would say, of course there is, because if you have left-wing parties in power in some countries and right-wing powers in power in other countries, if you want to have European integration, then you need to have this sort of centrist or liberal, if you want, uh, bias. We can do it you know, differently. We can have more national sovereignty, left-wing politics in some countries, right-wing in others, but then we would have to give up things such as uh, mobility, common market, euro, and other similar things that are basically essential for and, and uh, that, that, that uh, contribute to the welfare of the EU citizens. So this is why populists and Eurosceptics are mainly able to, you know, to, to, to gain support when there's a crisis to those uh, key things that the EU has contributed when there is a crisis to mobility, when there is a crisis to euro and things like that, because otherwise uh, public support to those issue, issues, to those things uh, is, is quite high. Uh, so uh, when, when EU does deliver, I think that there's also this strong uh, support of, of centrist uh, voters. Uh, for the EU. But of course, there are also some uh, dysfunctionalities uh, here. Uh, and uh, maybe instead of, you know, thinking of going backwards to more, you know, nationalism, more uh, nation states, we should also be, you know, bolder, be more brave and think about going forwards. What about having more, more of an EU level uh, political system where we could have EU level left wing, you know, politics for some time and which would then be replaced by EU level right wing politics. This is something that I think could work and could resolve this issue of, of centrist liberal bias and sovereignism versus globalism. Thank you very much, Marco. Nicola, you've been quiet for some time. Yeah, well, uh, 
despite the fact that uh, Vucic won convincingly the, you know, in, the, in the presidential elections, uh, the Serbian Progressive Party did not manage to win the majority by itself for the first time after eight years. So it will need coalition partners. So that, that already shows that uh, the party has certain problems when it comes to its popularity and maybe shows that uh, its grip on the, on, on the Serbian political system is, is weakening. So maybe Vukic himself remains quite popular and remains a strong man, but his party is not as strong as it used to be. So there might be some changes uh, in the future. We'll see how it uh, develops. But Vukic is a very cunning politician. He already reinvented himself at least once from a nationalist to a pro-European. So he can now tomorrow, if, if there is a need for that, reinvent himself from a from a pro-European nationalist into a extremely pro-European and pro-Western Democrat, if there is such a need uh, to, to do that. So uh, I believe it would not be so easy to see uh, the regime change uh, uh, here in Serbia uh, in the next uh, next uh, several years. But uh, there, there, is a, there is a chance for that. And uh, we could see some signs on these elections. And nobody can really say what the future brings, but it will have a lot to do with how does the EU treat Serbia. Is the EU, for example, going to be quite happy with the foreign policy change uh, and just uh, basically praise Serbian decisions and leave it a, a, a that way? Or it is going to assist even further on, on issues such as democracy and rule of law and results uh, in these areas? I believe this was and remains the fundamental question when it comes to the democratization of Serbia. Thank you, Nicola. Beata, final comments. Well, surely there will be a hard time for the government, but it would be hard to any government because of the war, because of the economic crisis. And now uh, the rule of law condition mechanism has been launched against Hungary, so the government could expect to suspend some EU funds sooner or later. But I'm still not sure whether this would affect them that much because those EU sanctions should be proportional, so we cannot really see how much money would be affected. Um, and uh, what uh, should be seen, I think that Orban is fighting uh, against the EU in, its, in his uh, rhetoric, but uh, still he voted for all the sanctions against Russia for now. Now he is fighting uh, upon the oil embargo, but he is not... Um, he will not veto, he just wants uh, some extension. So it's like it's like a bargaining. And, and I think it's also some legitimate interest and it's not just for Hungary, but also other Central European countries would uh, find themselves in a very, very difficult situation if they just couldn't buy more oil from Russia. So it's somehow a reasonable um, demand from him. Uh, so I think he, he will just keep this rhetorical fight, but actually he will act uh, aligned with the Western interests. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Peta. Last but certainly not least, Susin. Um, I think, um, like everybody else, I, I'm, I'm expecting quite a difficult period um, over the, um, the coming months and years in France. Um, I think, conversely to the way um, uh, Nicola described Vucic, Vucic as having reinvented himself from a nationalist to a, a European, um, I think that Macron is going to be pushed um, after the next legislative elections if um, Mélenchon's um, Union Populaire has, has um, uh, the majority to focus more nationally, so reinvent himself um, as, as more of a nationalist politician in the time being. And I think that that will have an impact on the European picture um, because, uh, the, because Macron um, has been sort of one of the, the visionary leaders, if you like, of, of EU um, over the last five years. And it seems clear from the early months of the current German government that despite their pro-European instincts, um, the divisions between that government um, mean that they can't sort of play that sort of, uh, yeah, um, uh, conceptual leadership role um, within the European project now. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting um, that uh, with the implications of the energy crisis and so on, um, uh, Europe's going to get um, sort of a rough ride um, over, over the coming years. And, um, uh, and, you know, I think a lot will depend on the extent to which uh, we manage to put both the kind of manage the, the sort of the trilemma effectively of um, a strong re response to Russia, um, uh, a, um, uh, a, a putting the green transition at the center of the way that we di diversify energy supplies within Europe, 
but also understanding that both those things push prices up and there needs to be a socio-economic response. Indeed, and I guess we, we will get a flavor of, uh, of that. We will see whether this pressure is already starting to, uh, to build because he's meant to address uh, uh, the European Parliament on the 9th of May. So uh, we'll see what his plans for our vision of Europe um, are uh, sooner rather than later. Um, Thank you very much. Um, we have come to the end of our uh, discussion. Uh, very grateful for your contributions. Many thanks to our participants as well. Um, we will continue this conversation. And in the meantime, I wish everyone a wonderful afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>